Take your Bibles tonight. Let's open up to the book of Daniel, chapter 4, and put your marker here, if you will, because this is where we're going to be tonight. As we return to Daniel 4, rather than opening up with some uh, illustration to set up the message, I just want to tell you about a dream, and in fact, we're going to read about this dream. It's a dream that disturbed the sleep of Nebuchadnezzar, and quite a dream it was. In Daniel chapter 4, starting in verse 10, as Daniel is, or as Nebuchadnezzar is relating this dream to Nebuchadnezzar, let's reverse that. As Nebuchadnezzar is relating this dream to Daniel, that's what I meant to say, he says this, thus were the visions of mine head in my bed. I saw and behold a tree in the midst of the earth, and the height thereof was great. The tree grew and was strong, and the height thereof reached unto heaven, and the sight thereof to the end of all the earth. The leaves thereof were fair, the fruit thereof much, and in it was meat for all. The beasts of the field had shadow under it, the fowls of the heaven dwelt in the bows thereof, and all flesh was fed of it. I saw in, my, in the visions of my head upon my bed, and behold, a watcher and a holy one came down from heaven. He cried aloud and said thus, Hew down the tree and cut off his branches. Shake off his leaves and scatter his fruit. Let the beasts get away from under it and the fowls from his branches. Nevertheless, leave the stump of his roots in the earth, even with a band of iron and brass in the tender grass of the field. And let it be wet with the dew of heaven and let his portion be with the beasts in the grass of the earth. Let his heart be changed from man's and let a beast's heart be given unto him. And let seven times pass over him. This matter is by the decree of the watchers and the demand by the word of the holy ones, to the intent that the living may know that the Most High God ruleth in the kingdom of men and giveth it to whomsoever he will, and setteth up over it the beasts of men. This dream I, Nebuchadnezzar, have seen. Now thou, O Belteshazzar, declare the interpretation thereof, for as much as all the wise men of my kingdom are not able to make known unto me the interpretation. But thou art able, for the Spirit of the holy gods is in thee. I think a couple of miracles takes place just in this dream alone. The first miracle is the dream itself. That God is able to give to Nebuchadnezzar in the midst of his sleep this dream, this vision in his head while he's he's just asleep and the Lord gives this to him and and uh, just the details of what is getting ready to happen. And in fact, as we'll see, it's going to take a year for this to happen. I think this is absolutely miraculous that God was able to do this with him. The other miracle, though, maybe it's not a miracle, but, uh, or maybe a smaller miracle, is the fact that he remembers this dream in all of its detail. Do you remember your dreams? How many of you actually remember your dreams? I don't ever. And I, I just absolutely hate dreaming. I really do. Because my dreams are action-packed. They're active dreams. They're stressful dreams. They're dreams that something is really going on. Every time that I wake up from the dream, man, I wake up, my heart's pounding, and I'm breathing heavy, and, and then it's just like wisps of vapor just is gone. I can remember vague details. And, and I mean vague, and it's the longer that I am awake, the less I can remember of it. And here's Nebuchadnezzar remembering this thing, I mean right down to the letter. I think that's miraculous myself. Now, maybe you wouldn't put that in the miracle category, that's okay. Uh, the dream was given, though, not for entertainment purposes. It didn't come about because Nebuchadnezzar had ate something the night before that disagreed with him or reacted with his system. He was given this dream for a purpose. This morning, we looked at lessons that we are learning from Daniel chapter 4 and from this whole story here. We're going to add to the three lessons we saw this morning. Here's the fourth lesson. The fourth lesson is that we have to speak the truth, but speak it in love. We have to speak the truth, but speak it in love. Verse 19 Then Daniel, whose name was Belteshazzar, was astonished for one hour, and his thoughts troubled him. The king spake and said, Belteshazzar, let not the dream or the interpretation thereof trouble thee. Belteshazzar answered and said, My lord, the dream be to them that hate thee, and the interpretation thereof to thine enemy. 
the interpretation of the dream shook Daniel up as much as the dream, or even more so than the dream shook up Nebuchadnezzar. Daniel was hesitant to share the interpretation, but Nebuchadnezzar pushed and he says, Daniel, I don't want you to hold anything back. Tell me the truth. Let me know exactly what this says. He wanted to know the truth regardless of what it was. In a Forbes magazine article, it said, most people say yes when asked if they want to hear the truth. In fact, 88% of employees say they want to hear the truth if their job performance was poor. And yet, how many people do you know who, after slaving away on a big project, are grateful when the boss comes in and says, the report you wrote was illogical, poorly written, two hours late, and riddled with typos. The author of the article says, I've witnessed adults who insist that they can handle the truth, cry and rant and even punch the walls upon hearing truth like that. The truth sounds good in theory, especially if it's truth with which we agree or that positions us in favorable light. It's when we hear truth that isn't so pleasant that we stand to resist. And I think that is very, very true. By and large, people really don't want to hear the truth, especially if the truth hurts. That's true in our marriages, isn't it? Let me give you two examples. Gentlemen, your wife puts on a new outfit and says, does this make me look fat? There's not a man alive that should answer that question. <laughs> don't go there. It isn't going to turn out well. I don't care how you answer that question. It isn't going to turn out well for you. Or, guys, you've just finished a project. You're exceptionally proud of what you think that you accomplished. For instance, you mowed the yard, and you trimmed the yard. And I mean, it just looks, wow, your lines are straight. I mean, it's pretty. It is a work of art. And your wife gets, you get ready to go, and you, she hasn't said a thing about it. So you say, well, honey, how does the yard look? I didn't even know it needed mowed. You can, guys, you know exactly, it's just like, you didn't want to hear that. You wanted her to say, man, that just, oh, wow, you are just the best lawnmower there is. You know, you want them to say things like that. Even if it's an exaggeration, you still want it. Uh, you can understand why Daniel was hesitant to tell Nebuchadnezzar the truth about this dream, because there's nothing good about it. You know what, Christians, we are obligated to tell the truth. We are bound by God's Word to be truthful individuals. We have to be. We don't have any right whatsoever to beat around the bush and not be honest. But we got to speak the truth in love. We are not called upon to be harsh, to be critical, to be blunt in a mean-spirited way. Tell the truth, yes, but it's got to be couched in love. God's love. Turn with me in your Bible to the book of Ephesians chapter 4. Ephesians chapter 4. In the book of Ephesians chapter 4 verse 15. The Bible tells us here, but speaking the truth, and then it stops and moves on to the next sentence, right? What does it say? Speaking the truth in love may grow up into him in all things, which is the head, even Christ. Jump to verse 25. Wherefore, putting away lying, speak every man truth with his neighbor, for we are members one of another. Go to the book of Colossians chapter 4. Colossians chapter 4, verse 6. And here the Bible says, let your speech be always with grace, seasoned with salt, that you may know how you ought to answer every man. You know, this is a hard truth that some Christians, I'm not, I don't really worry about the world. I am concerned about Christianity. This is an issue that, that some in Christianity have not learned. They are bound and determined they're going to speak the truth, and man, they're just going to wham, like a sledgehammer. There's no truth, there's no grace, just tons and tons and tons of salt. Um, this is, they'll, they'll say something, they'll blog, tweet, DM, post, text something. It may be 100% right. There is no error in it whatsoever. 
But there's no love. There's no grace. And when there's no love and there's no grace, grace, speaking the truth comes across arrogant and prideful. And you and I as believers in Christ, we don't need to be doing that, do we? Uh, If you have been told in, in your life that you are an individual that is too blunt, that you're an individual that's too harsh, too critical, you shouldn't have said it that way, well, what was wrong with what I said? Not what, it's the how. If you've been told that in your life more than once, you might want to ask somebody before you post it, before you write it, before you say it. You might want to run it by somebody and say, okay, this is what I'm wanting to say. Tell me, is this in love? Does this sound in love? Does this sound in grace? Does this sound like something that would be received well? Uh, Ask yourself some questions before we speak. And I say this to all of us. Is it any of your business? Is it any of your business? Or did you just decide to stick your nose into something? Don't do that. Somebody's going to chop it off. And then you're going to get upset and go, well, I don't know why they were so upset with me. Because you stuck your nose in where it didn't belong. And, and down comes the butcher, butcher's knife. You know, flap, it's gone. Was the comment as invited as it was by Nebuchadnezzar? Nebuchadnezzar invited the truth. He says, Daniel, tell me. I want to know exactly what this dream meant. Does it need to be said? Is this the way to say it? And how will the individual receive it coming from me versus coming from somebody else? You know, we've, we learn this in parenting. For the, How many grandparents are here? Put your hands up, grandparents. Do you realize, grandparents, you will be able to tell the grandchild things that your child, who is that kid's parent, will not be able to tell them. But they will receive it from the grandparent. And that's going to upset you as a parent. You're going, that's what I've been telling them. Mm -hmm. But you know what happens when, when you become a grandparent? All you grandparents, it's true, you get squishy. You really do. Parents, well, I never would have got away with that. Boy, if I'd done that, you know, the boom would have gotten lowered. And you see how the grandparents act with their grandkids like, that ain't the same parent I had. Who is this person? Who's this stranger that creeped into my house? You got squishy. That's not a bad thing, you know it? Because you're going to have an opportunity to take that grandchild and bring them in for a big old scrunch, and whisper into their ear the things that moms and dads have been trying to tell them, and because you're grandma or grandpa, they're going to listen, and you're going to have their ear. Now, what do my parents know? Oh, but grandma and grandpa, boy, they're special. Grandmas and grandpas are pretty special, aren't they? You got your grandparents here tonight? Are they special? (laughs) Okay, (laughs) evidently not, evidently not. All right, let's go back to Daniel chapter 4. Before looking at the next point, let's summarize the interpretation. Daniel chapter 4, verse 22. The summary is this. It is thou, O king, thou art grown and become strong. For thy greatness is grown and reacheth unto heaven and thy dominion to the end of the earth. Verse 25 that they shall drive thee from men, and thy dwelling shall be with the beasts of the field. They shall make thee to eat grass as oxen. They shall wet thee with the dew of heaven, and seven times shall pass over thee, till thou know that the Most High ruleth in the kingdom of men, and giveth it to whomsoever he will. Some really bad things are getting ready to happen to this king. But here's the next lesson that we need to get. After sharing bitter truth, offer hope. After sharing bitter truth, offer hope. We have, let's assume, we have given the truth, we have given it in love, we have given it with grace. Daniel, as I, as I read the words, I don't hear Daniel looking with any kind of accusation, pointing his finger at the king and saying, you king, you've done this, you've done that, this is getting ready to happen to you king. I'm telling you the truth. I don't picture Daniel doing that. Daniel didn't even want to share this message with him. 
The king is the one who said, I need to hear this, Daniel. You've got to tell me. And so Daniel starts sharing it. And I picture Daniel maybe trembling a little bit. I picture and I can hear a softness and a tenderness in his voice. And after sharing bitter truth, offer sweet hope. In Daniel chapter 4, verse 27. Wherefore, O king, let my counsel be acceptable unto thee, and break off thy sins by righteousness and thine iniquities, by showing mercy to the poor, if it may be a lengthening of thy tranquility. He held out hope. Do you realize, Christians, that that is exactly what we are supposed to do? We are to hold out hope. Not condemnation, not ridicule, not anything like that. We are to hold out hope to an individual, and that hope is Jesus. Thomas Chisholm wrote these familiar words in 1923. Pardon for sin and a peace that endureth. Thine own dear presence to cheer and to guide. Strength for today and bright hope for tomorrow. Blessings all mine with 10,000 beside. That's hope. That's a hope that was offered to every single one of us in, as our sins were pardoned. Turn in your Bible to Psalm 130. Psalm 130. You know, I think sometimes Christians, we forget especially if we've been saved for any length of time, we forget the pardon, the grace, the mercy that was shown to us. We forget that, that, that God was so good to us when we deserve condemnation and we deserve instantaneous uh, entrance into hell. And yet the pardon that He gave us, the hope, that was offered to every sinner because of Christ. Romans 5 eight. but God commendeth His love toward us and that while we were yet what? Christ died for us. That's hope. In Psalm 103, look at the first uh, four, or Psalm 130, excuse me. Psalm 130, the first four verses. Out of the depths have I cried unto thee, O Lord. Lord, hear my voice. Let thine ears be attentive to the voice of my supplications. If thou, Lord, shouldst mark iniquities, O Lord, who should sta shall stand? But there is forgiveness with thee, that thou mayest be feared. The hope of the gospel is the forgiveness of sins and a new relationship with God through Jesus Christ. Go to the book of 2 Corinthians chapter 5. Let's look at what it says for the, believer, for the lost person. 2 Corinthians chapter 5 verses 18 and 19. Verse 17, while you're turning there, verse 17 is the one that we know that we can quote, therefore if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. All things are passed away, behold, all things are become new. Verse 18. And all things are of God who hath reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ and hath given to us the ministry of reconciliation to wit that God was in Christ reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing their trespasses unto them and hath committed unto us the word of reconciliation. I cannot reconcile anybody to God, but I can take the word of reconciliation to them. And that is the ministry that God has not just given to me. God has given this ministry to every single child of God. You're in the business of reconciling or bringing the message of reconciliation to a lost world so that the work can be done by God through Jesus Christ to reconcile humanity to God. That's our job. Every one of us, you say, well, I'm not a preacher. So? Well, I'm not a deacon. So? I'm not a Sunday school teacher, so are you a Christian? That's the only qualification necessary. Are you a Christian or have you been born again? If so, the ministry of reconciliation has been given to you, and we're supposed to take that message to everybody that we possibly can. The hope of the sinning saint. Do saints sin? Okay, what's the ministry of, uh, of hope that's given to us? That ministry is found in Galatians chapter 6 and verse 1, where the Bible says, Brethren, if a man be overtaken in a fault, ye who are spiritual do what? Restore such a one. The sinning saint is offered forgiveness, healing, and restoration. We've got to understand the heart of God. What is God's heart towards a lost world? 
It's hard sometimes to reconcile this in our head because we know Psalm 7 and verse 11 tells us that God is angry with the wicked all the day. And that is true. But also we have Ezekiel 33 and verse 11 that says, Say unto them, As I live, saith the Lord God, I have no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but that the wicked turn from his way and live. Turn ye, turn ye from your evil ways. For why will ye die, O house of Israel? That's the heart of God. He is not taking pleasure in the death and the destruction of the wicked. He's not in heaven going, oh boy, I can hardly wait to pronounce final judgment and condemnation on. It's not what the scripture teaches. The Lord wants us to repent. He wants the lost to repent. Is that the God that we present to the unsaved? Is that the God that we present to the sinning believer? Is this the God that we uh, present to, the, to everybody? Do you realize Daniel is begging this man, pleading with him, please? Please be reconciled to God. Who's the last person you pleaded with? Who's the last person that you begged? You say, oh, I don't think I need to do that. I see the examples of it in Scripture. When did we ever care about somebody that much? We just pleaded with them, please, give your life to Jesus. Why are you holding off? Just begging them to trust the Lord. Now notice the next point. Go back to Daniel chapter 4. The next point is this. Pride invites punishment. Pride invites punishment. Daniel chapter 4, verse 25. The last part of verse 25. All this is going to happen to this king until thou know that the Most High ruleth in the kingdom of men and he giveth it to whomsoever he will. Daniel tells Nebuchadnezzar that he is going to go through this until he knows that he's not in charge. Until he knows that he is not in this position because he is such a great individual. He is in this position because God's put him there. And how is how's this going to take place? Does any of this begging get Nebuchadnezzar's attention? Not hardly. Look at verse 28. All this came upon the king Nebuchadnezzar at the end of 12 months. He walked in the palace in the kingdom of Babylon. And the king spake and said, Is not this great Babylon that I have built for the house of the kingdom by the might of my power for the honor of my majesty? Whew. How quickly he has forgotten. One year later, from the pronouncement of God's judgment, Nebuchadnezzar walks out and just, I, 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 me, me, me. He's got to have shoulder issues from patting himself on the back so much. Pride's a dangerous, dangerous sin. Keep your marker here. Go with me to the book of Proverbs chapter 16. Do we recognize tonight just how dangerous pride is. And if so, what do we do to keep ourselves humble? What do we do to not have a prideful attitude? Proverbs 16, verse 5, the Bible says, Everyone that is proud in heart is an abomination to the Lord. Though hand join in hand, he shall not be unpunished. This morning we saw in Leviticus and Deuteronomy that homosexuality, sodomy, is an abomination. Do you realize that pride is called the exact same thing? I mean, I would think that every one of us as Christians, when we talk about the sexual sins and things like that, oh boy, that's awful. Oh, the sodomy, the homosexuality in this nation, oh, it's just terrible. You're right. So is the pride. So is the pride. You know what, Christians? While we may not have the first sin in the midst of our church, we can sure be full of the second, second sin, can't we? We can be full of pride. We can be filled with this abomination. Look at verse 18. Pride goeth before destruction and a haughty spirit before a fall. Is that going to happen if we are prideful? Yep. 
How's it going to happen? Don't know, but it's going to happen. Luke chapter 14, verse 11, the Bible says, For whosoever exalteth himself shall be abased, and he that humbleth himself shall be exalted. So if we want to be prideful, if we want to promote ourselves, go for it. But just remember, God's going to knock you down. He has to. He has no choice because he said that he would. He's going to knock us down. But if we humble ourselves, God says he will exalt us. Ronald Reagan tells this story. Ronald Reagan, a great storyteller. I mean, I love to hear him tell stories. And he tells this story on himself. He said, I once addressed a very large, distinguished audience in Mexico City and sat down to rather scattered and unenthusiastic applause. I was somewhat embarrassed, even more so, when the next man who spoke, a representative of the Mexican government, speaking in Spanish, which I don't understand, was being interpreted virtually every other line with the most enthusiastic kind of applause. To hide my embarrassment, I started clapping before anybody else and longer than anybody else until our ambassador leaned over and said to me, I wouldn't do that if I was you, Mr. President. He's interpreting your speech. Oh boy, you didn't get that, did you? Reagan was, inter was applauding his own speech being interpreted. He did it by mistake. It was accidental. How many of us applaud our own speech, our accomplishments, the things we've done? We boast and we brag and we want other people to pump us on the back as well. In the book of James chapter 4 and verse 6, the Bible tells us that God resisteth the proud. I've shared this two or three weeks ago. When it says that God resists the proud, it means literally that He arrays Himself in battle against. It's a military term. It doesn't mean just resistance, providing resistance, but actually it brings Him to a battle stance where He will fight against those who are prideful. Christians, tonight, do you and I really want our Father to fight against us? Oh, He would never do that against His children. Well, according to James 4, 6, He will. Just try Him. He has no choice. Now go back to Daniel chapter 4. Verses 31 to 33, While the word was in the king's mouth, there fell a voice from heaven, saying, O King Nebuchadnezzar, to thee it is spoken, the kingdom has departed from thee. And they shall drive thee from men, and thy dwelling shall be with the beasts of the field. They shall make thee to eat grass as oxen, and seven times shall pass over thee, until thou know that the Most High ruleth in the kingdom of men, and giveth it to whomsoever he will. The same hour was the thing fulfilled upon Nebuchadnezzar, and he was driven from men, and did eat grass as oxen, and his body was wet with the dew of heaven, till his hairs were grown like eagle's feathers, and his nails like bird's claws." Here's the seventh point. God's righteousness causes Him to intervene when we believe we don't need Him anymore or when we refuse to acknowledge Him. God's righteousness causes Him to intervene. British playwright George Bernard Shaw put it this way, There are two tragedies in life. One is to lose your heart's desire and the other is to gain it. We don't look at it that way. In our eyes, gaining our heart's desire is the very purpose of life itself. But how many people have achieved their dreams only to be ruined in the process? Success can be just as big a temptation as failure. Perhaps more so, since success tends to make us take life for granted. While it's true that God speaks to us both ways, we tend to listen more when God speaks through sorrow, pain, loss, and personal failure. Success tends to make us complacent, but failure cannot be denied. For seven years, Nebuchadnezzar lost his mind. Nebuchadnezzar turns into something like a beast of the field. His hygiene went right out the window. We talked about this over the last three Wednesday nights. As we look at this and we look at Nebuchadnezzar, we have to admit that symptoms like Nebuchadnezzar could be medical because the brain can get sick, right? Because it's a bodily organ. We also have to acknowledge that this can be just a spiritual issue. And we don't have to wonder about the diagnosis of Nebuchadnezzar. 
This isn't a medical issue. This is a spiritual issue. God's the one that unraveled his mind. God's the one that brought this about and brought this man incredibly low. Nebuchadnezzar wasn't having a medical problem. He was having a spiritual problem, and it took seven years to run its course. Wow. Do you realize that if you're going through spiritual issues, you're going through deep, dark times in your life, and it's definitely a spiritual issue, you could go through it for a very long time until God gets a hold of your heart, until God is done trying to get a lesson taught to you. You say, oh, I just want this to go away today. God says, if it went away today, you'd be right back where he was at. It's going to take time. And it took seven years to bring him through this. But here's the final lesson. Restoration is available. Verses 34 through 37, and at the end of the days, the seven years, I, Nebuchadnezzar, lifted up mine eyes into heaven, and mine understanding returned unto me, and I blessed the Most High, and I praised and honored him that liveth forever whose dominion is an everlasting dominion, and his kingdom is from generation to generation. And all the inhabitants of the earth are reputed as nothing. And he doeth according to his will in the army of heaven and among the inhabitants of the earth. And none can stay his hand or say unto him, What doest thou? At the same time, my reason returned unto me, and for the glory of my kingdom, mine honor and brightness returned unto me. And my counselors and my Lord sought unto me, and I was established in my kingdom, and excellent majesty was added unto me. Now I, Nebuchadnezzar, praise and extol and honor the King of heaven, all whose works are truth, and His ways judgment, and those that walk in pride, He is able to abase. Many commentators believe that Nebuchadnezzar's story is that of a man who was lost and is now saved. Others believe that his admission doesn't go far enough to grant the fact that he would be saved, but he has just come along in his religious experience, but he just hasn't arrived there yet. As I said this morning, I'm not going to make a decision on that. I'm not going to try to tell you or try to convince you one way or the other. What I am going to tell you is what's obvious in the Scripture. Something's changed in this man. Something has changed in how he is acting. Something has changed in how he is taught or how he's talking. Tonight, if you know the Lord Jesus Christ is your Savior, things should have changed in your life. Have they? Can you point to the things in your life that have changed? Can you point to the things in your life that God is working on right now, that He is changing, that He is challenging you on? Can you point to those things? If you're sitting here tonight and you say, well, no, I'm pretty much the same person I've always been, then you have good reason to question whether or not you're genuinely saved. Well, no, I've always been a pretty decent person, pretty good person. You were never good enough for salvation. You couldn't save yourself. All we are like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way. The Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. All of us have iniquity. So we can't say, well, I was in church all my life. I've always been a good person. Romans says there's none good but God. So if we have come to the point of salvation where we call upon the name of the Lord as Savior, we've had to admit that we needed a Savior. Even the good little kid back in Sunday school class will come to a point saying, I need a Savior. Have you come to that point in your life? If not, what's it going to take to get you to that point? Does God have to drop you like He dropped Nebuchadnezzar? God can do it. Don't think for a second that God cannot do whatever it would take to get your attention. I don't know what it would take to get our individual attention. I don't think it would necessarily be the same thing. It would be something tailor-made just for you. And if it's necessary, God will do it. Don't push Him to do that. Yield, surrender to Him tonight. If you're here without Jesus Christ as your Savior, this is the night to repent and to believe the gospel. Would you do that this evening? The gospel message is simply that Jesus died on the cross for your sins. He was buried, and He rose again from the tomb. He is alive. That's the simplicity of the gospel. You've got to come to a point where you would repent, you would believe it, and you would believe it so much that you would call upon the name of the Lord Jesus Christ to be saved. If you've never done that, why not tonight? Christian, tonight, however the Lord is dealing with with you, 
would you respond to the Lord? Stand with me, please, with our heads bowed and our eyes closed. Heavenly Father, tonight we thank you, Lord, for what we see in the book of Daniel. We thank you, Lord, for how you dealt with this very evil pagan king. We thank you, Lord, that in the midst of your judgment upon an individual, at least this side of eternity, there is hope. There is the opportunity to know you as Savior. There is opportunity to be restored from the sins that have destroyed us. But Lord, help us to realize that once we have died, that hope is gone if we don't know Jesus as Savior. It's gone. No second chance in hell. Tonight, that lost soul, we just pray that they're under such conviction that this would be the night that they give their heart and their life to you. Tonight, Lord, we pray as believers in Christ that we might look carefully at ourselves. If we are prideful, if we are individuals who won't speak your truth with love and grace, then deal with us tonight. We pray and ask it in Jesus' name.